Hello chess friends, this is International Master Valera Liu, and today we're going to be talking about a really interesting topic that is both um, quite exciting and I believe very instructive. This is Bobby Fischer start coming. Now, very few know about this. Essentially, this is a very speculative um, kind of mystery part. Uh, but after Fischer left the chess world, um, once he won the match in 1972, he returned for a rematch uh, versus Boris Baskin in the 1990s. And then he left the world of chess, chess again. Now, before he passed away in um, the late 2000s, essentially there was um, a moment uh, that was actually called the third coming of Bobby Fischer. And many believed, even top grandmasters like Nigel Short, that Fischer has actually come back for a series of online games. Now, this is speculative because there is, there were, there were only a few speculation type of um, ways to um, prove this. But um, it's quite interesting. I mean, let me give you a little bit of the story before we go on with the analysis of the actual games and what made it uh, so exciting for me to see back then. Uh, I was only uh, 10 years old when this happened. Ultimately, the idea was that uh, Bobby Fischer, it was a rumor back at the time, sometimes logs on to play online in the uh, Internet Chess Club. And he sets up as a guest, playing an incredible series of blitz games against random opponents. The pattern, always being the same, he logs in, you know, nobody, you know, nobody knows uh, exactly what Fisher's name is because he doesn't have an official handle. He makes direct contact, um, either directly or through a third person, and then plays a series of fast blitz games, or bullet, versus... Uh, you know, a de you know, decent grandmaster players. He used practically terrible openings um, to begin with and essentially turned them into something incredibly amazing that, uh, you know, nobody could really understand. Now, all this, all this is a chess club story until actually Grandmaster Nigel Short went public um, with his encounter about the mysterious ICC Fisher, as it was called, in the Telegraph um, back in the old days. So Short revealed that he's played nearly 50 speed games versus Fisher during that year. And he said, quote, unquote, I'm 99% sure that I've been playing against the chess legend. That's what he said back then. It's tremendously exciting. And uh, he said he was um, like in October that year, I believe it was 2001, in those in the first of their confrontations, Nigel lost zero to eight. Although he's practically one of the world's best chess players. In addition, what he said is that in my opinion, Fisher is a much stronger speed chess player than Kasparov, which is incredible when one considers that at fifty-eight he's virtually uh, uh, geriatric in terms of the modern game. And then there came the idea of a proof. You see, the final proof came when. He, when Nigel Short asked his mysterious opponent online, do you know Armando Acevedo? Uh, he, he's an obscure Mexican player. And the response immediately was Zegan 9070. Fisher had actually played Acevedo in the Zegan Chess Olympiad of 9070. And if you think about this, now let's imagine that we have a browser open or any program that has that game in the database. It will take five to ten seconds until one can type in the name or you know just just search for it wait until a result shows up so you could say but the truth is you know it didn't take more than two seconds for uh you know for, for that message to appear as a response so essentially this provides a strong proof that this was probably fisher now let's really talk a bit about um you know what these games were all about. Now, this is very interesting. The way Fisher started every game. Now here's an example that he played versus a pretty strong grandmaster opponent. He started the game with f3. Now 
after d5, there is the move of c3 and king f2. Now, this is no opening to be played by any grandmaster. Now, somebody would say that probably he wanted to avoid actually going into Thierry, but the reality is that after the move of uh, king f2, what you see is that white played king e3. Then, of course, he blocked in the center and he came back with the king, then went on to win. We're going to see how he did that and why I thought I felt like these games were great. But now we actually talk about, you know, back in 2001, some of the best chess programs like Fritz and Junior, Shredder, Tiger. Um, ultimately, all of them could have actually played these games, uh, you know, and probably start and win. And yet, there is an incredible amount, there was an incredible amount of human moves that the computer really doesn't even suggest. So you could actually see a pattern. And I've made some of my chess cheating videos, um, you know, back in a couple years ago, when I used to have that theory that if a chess player is going to cheat, you can always say why. Now, you can't say why if you're an intermediate or an amateur player, because, you know, an intermediate or amateur player cannot recognize that pattern. He cannot see um, what really makes a great master as opposed to what makes a great computer play. But basically speaking, it's all about one thing. It's the sequence. Like, pretty much a computer program is going to make an absolutely perfect sequence of moves, one-lined, and win the game. While a human is going to meander, essentially meaning that he's going to make moves that probably don't make sense or make little sense, you know, along the way, and uh, he would still be able to win in a fantastic style. Now, some might argue that Kentaur can do it, that Kentaur was uh, developed, like an idea that a human can play one move and a computer can play the best moves when the, when the game's critical, but keep in mind that this was a blitz game. There is no way how playing a three-minute uh, plus zero increment time control could ever be manipulated in such a way. So we could either imagine that a computer played it or a really strong grandmaster played it. Now, and because many of the computer moves do not match with what was the logic of the game and the, and the sequence, the only way to say it, it, it was it was really great grandmaster who did it. And uh, the style really resembles one of the greatest, not just a grandmaster. Um, so um, let's talk a little bit about what really happened in those games, actually. So um, first of all, in this game that we're looking at, that was played um, between the Fisher player and, and a Grandmaster who had played with Black, his rating was uh, 2,800. You know, basically White started with this crazy idea of bringing his king up, and then he went down. Apparently this is losing. But from that one, you're going to see a brilliant strategy. Despite the loss of five tempi and getting the king exposed, White starts to build a structure from the nothing. He starts with a move like e3, and then he plays a4, basically. This move helps him to get a little more space on the queen side. Knight e2. And by the way, keep in mind that a lot of the moves that we're going to see, even logical, do not exist in the top moves of a chess engine. Like, the easiest way to compare if somebody's playing himself or with an engine is if you actually look at the top three or five choices of, of a top engine. These moves were not present. So, basically, we could only say that it was a human playing them. And then you see White is closing the position right now, thereby preventing Black from any possibility to counter. Edix F, G -dix F. And then, of course, there was b3. Now, a lot of those moves were made so that he could stabilize the structure effectively. This is very interesting. Now, sometimes people say, as a chess player, Fisher was always a gentleman. A real Fisher would never insult his opponents by playing ridiculous openings. But the truth is, if you think about it, it wasn't really so much about, you know, practically playing an opening that's insulting. In a way... This was an experiment to see if the opponent can punish, can basically use their head head start in order to take advantage. And then, of course, when they couldn't do it, 
Like, by the way, is a, Fisher's opponent in this game was um, Grandmaster, actually then International Master, I believe, Robert Fontaine, whose uh, rating was almost 2,500. So basically, in this game, as you could see, White really set up a very stable position, and as the game progressed, he continued to move forward. Now, this is really exciting because no chess engine is ever going to play c4. This was a, a, an entirely human move. It goes against the rules because most engines are pro provided with the idea that one should never open up the position where his king is in the middle and the pieces are in develop. But from a human perspective, this move makes a lot of sense because in some way, c4, even though it's a risky move, forces black to make a precise decision on how to exploit it, which in blitz is much harder than you can imagine. And also, it actually suggests that if black loses the pawn on d5, then his whole center is going to be gone. And so, white can take a large advantage of the position. So, of course, black played d to the c, and this was actually a mistake. He should have played c5, but as I mentioned again, this is basically, it was blitz, and in blitz, you must Think about this very carefully. Now, Black should have opened the position to, to claim some possibilities. He did it this way. And, of course, he, did, he, miss, uh, he misunderstood Bishop takes f5, e takes d4, knight d5, and queen takes d4. This was a brilliant sequence that practically, uh, you know, after the move of knight to the d5, it's, um, it's really just amazing, as, as a matter of fact. After continuing with the move of knight to the d5, uh, the very next move, and, uh, you know, just this happens to be queen takes d4, destroying the knight and practically killing black. Now, you may say, okay, but Valeri, this is black made a blunder. Now, I want to tell you something. Every game that ever gets won by any player on any level is because of a mistake. If nobody makes a mistake, the game's likely going to be a draw. So if you are actually talking about a grandmaster making a mistake, you'll see this happening at any level, even at top grandmaster level nowadays on classical chess so when you're looking at a game saying all right you know okay it was a human opponent that's true but probably just he won you know it could have been anyone because black has black made mistakes or he made a blunder keep in mind anybody makes mistakes or a blunder this does not by any means by any chance undermine the quality of White's play, the way he set up the formation and the practical chance that he took that a computer, for example, would never do or, uh, uh, you know, you know, like just, just any, any other player, actually. I wouldn't imagine the bravery of evaluating all the proper circumstances when a move like this really came into place. So it was a, it was a very beautiful, beautiful resource. Now, let's talk a little bit about um, another game. That was actually played. Another one of these uh, excellent Fisher games. So the other game I want to show you was actually played again by Fisher. However, this time he was actually playing with the black pieces. And it may be interesting for you to know what he was able to achieve with this. So we flip the board. We actually get the black pieces. And we talk about same Grandmaster. Playing with white, black actually picked up more or less the same opening. Check, king d6, that this time he even forced it a bit more, giving black an extra pawn, and now stabilizing the position, making sure that the pieces go out quickly, queen e7. Now, trust me, when I talk about Fisher, I believe that it was Fisher, because, this is at least my opinion, I mean, you can decide for yourself, that because one quality that Fisher had back in the in the old days that many people don't do appreciate actually and that's why he's a legend is that Fisher had an incredible sense of dynamics that means even the slightest moment where the position had to be treated a little bit faster a little bit slower he would find exactly the right direction the right sequence that fits the change fits that shift. It's hard to understand, but that's why he was able to get such brilliant positions in many of his games against Spassky and against other players like Petrosian and Taimonov. Whatever the situation would be, he would always evaluate the dynamics to perfection so he can pick up the most effective practical choice. 
So in this case, as you can see, Black realizes that his position is still difficult, but he managed to stabilize it and then get the most out of every piece as much as it's possible. Here's another example. Every engine would suggest bishop takes f3 because it makes more sense to exchange the knight do knight d7. But Fisher knew that by playing bishop takes f3, this is a computer move, a typical computer move that every engine would do because of the programming. The programming suggests no matter the material, you've got to take away any pieces that could be in trouble to you. So essentially, Bishop takes f97, 95 makes more sense. It would simplify the game, it would reduce Black's chances, but it makes it easier to play. Yet Fisher knew that if he exchanges, there's no practical chance to win. So the practical chance stands in the possibility to maintain the bishop and actually develop the pieces, even though there could have been the danger of white playing maybe a move like e5 or something at some point. But again, it's very harder to calculate this. So, knight d7, bishop f6. Now again, very interesting move. Rook e1, knight e5. Black sets up an incredible blockade in the center, thus reducing the power of white's pieces. And then, now you can see that the extra pawn really turns out uh, a quite a bit of a problem. Now, again, you may argue bishop takes e5 wasn't a great move. You know, probably why we scared about the knight. He didn't want to take with his knight because of bishop h4 after the recapture. So maybe he should have played knight d4. Now, if you think that way, you're right. If you're going to play with the king up like this, your opponent definitely needs to make a mistake so that you could win. And yet, once again, remember, this was a very strong opponent Fisher was playing against, uh, an actual grandmaster. So, a mistake, especially one that looks very logical, like exchanging a bishop for a knight in the turn three minute game, is very easy to make. So, again, like in every game, essentially the mistake always happens by the player who loses. But the quality of the of the black play, creating the stability, setting up the blockade, and then really utilizing the firepower to reach the white king. It's kind of amazing, really. Just it's it's a beautiful thing how he got the two rooks, the knight, and then the bishop to to actually claim a perfect advantage, and uh, I'll play white brilliantly. Now that's just one more example of what it means to have a perfect game. Now there were many games like that, you know, like in in Fisher's match. I want to show you a couple more highlights because. Uh, this is a really an incredible sequence, and, and I believe one that really brings us to the sad truth of really losing Fisher for so many for so many years. In 1972, he was in his prime, and uh, I think a couple of years later, he had to face Karpov. And I think with the young Anatoly Karpov being brilliant at the positional play and making sure that he you know follows his way to the top. Playing against someone like Fisher in his prime would have been an incredible match. I still believe that Fisher would have won, but it would have been a match that uh, would be worth talking about, you know, always for for a long time. And so again, Fisher's games just provide that type of sensation of incredible value that you know we we can't see nowadays. Now, if you're thinking, okay, Fisher was only playing that badly. Not really. I mean, there's a game, here's a nice game that um, ultimately shows that there were games in which he basically played very properly. So it wasn't like his choice to always go for, for different, uh, you know, wrong lines. Now, even though this opening is not very popular nowadays, uh, it led him to a very decent position, Fisher's Black versus the same Grandmaster. He developed his pieces. And here's another great quality that great masters have. They know that preparation is everything. Whatever the position is, you can always take up the right set of moves to let your opponent push through. And the trick is that if your opponent advances a little bit too fast, like he did with the move of knight e5 here, you can be more prepared to counter and the further sequences are actually going to go in your favor. This is exactly what Black did with the move rook takes d5, rook d8, Rook a5 and rook takes a2. It's an interesting idea because now if white played a3, the precision for black was that he would take away the light squares 
get the queen and the activity of black's rooks, the bishop, the queen, and even the pawn that could have challenged white was to provide him with um, an incredible advantage going forward. White played queen f4, rook takes a2, take on the b2, bishop b3, and uh, in a couple of the moves that followed, black became very successful and he won the, won the game. A lot of these are really perfect examples. But I want to show you a pretty interesting thing that is just nice as uh, in terms of, a, of an exploration. There was a game that he played with the white pieces. And this is a pretty exciting game, actually, that happened between him and the grandmaster. So basically, Fisher started with e4, king e2, king e3. So he played d3 goes back with the king, and essentially after that he moved down to e1. So he lost a lot of tempi and his castling, and yet from this point on he stabilizes the position, gets the right activity in place, drives away the black knight, and, you know, let black to kind of rush the position. Now the reason why black isn't able to take successful advantage in this position is because there are no threats. There is preparation, but there are really no threats. And of course, there is the brilliant bishop d4 that black could have played, which I think that would have sort of collapsed white's position. And of course, you cannot allow yourself to go with the king to e3 and go back and, and go unharmed, but this is a three-minute game. And how many people do you think in a three-minute blitz game are going to play bishop to d4? I mean, if it was Fisher with black, probably you would have seen that, but not for most of the Morton people. So black just played a standard a6 defending the pawn. And so that gave white a little more time to continue with the development, drive black's queen, finish up with knight f3, and uh, then do knight d2, knight c5, takes, bishop takes d2, rook takes d2, takes change, takes, and now black sacrificed the piece, but there is no clear way on how he can take advantage. And so, White is two bishops up, but he cannot prevent a perpetual after, you know, king b1 and everything. So, it's interesting because this is a very nice position to explore. White played bishop takes c4 here. At first, you know, one of the um, chess masters, I think, Tim Krabbe, said, I thought this was a typical computer move. Um, the computer programs do look at it, but they always go for the queen takes to b5 move. Queen takes to b1, queen a1. With a draw, like here's the draw, takes, queen a1, king c2, um, queen e2. You know, the truth is, computer may look at the move of bishop takes c4, even if it's not one of these top moves, and yet they don't choose it, because it is kind of, I would say, irrational. See, I would say that a typical human move in this kind of position is to think about the easiest way to get out, not to leave. But what makes bishop take c4 is that it does not change the result. This is very important. It just could be a really nice possibility to let the opponent go wrong. That's what um, Krabbe said. Well, if black plays, for instance, queen takes to the c5, there could be queen takes b5. So it's more of a human type of move. You know, they could computer could do a move of bishop takes to the c4 but it's likely not going to happen you know and uh, it's very interesting in the game bishop takes c4 gave black an opportunity to mess it up which he did by the way b takes to the c4 and then white played rook c1 so we're, what we're seeing here is psychology you know uh, one may argue that there are a lot of you know explanations as to why white played this and that and and of course this is you know when there is no definitive proof that it was fisher one can always argue that this was probably a strong top grandmaster just trying to have fun and sunday night you know but truth is this wasn't just a normal play this was a great play this was someone who had a deep profound understanding and even though a lot of grandmasters do the sense of dynamics so effectively, you know, resembles the one that Fisher had back in the 1970s and back, you know, in the, in the 90s when he played with Spassky. Such a greatness is rarely seen nowadays, even in the games of the top grandmasters. 
what is so exciting is that, of course, after Rook C1, Black lost it. But um, it's just almost kind of impossible. Also, let's let me tell you that uh, you know when you think about this, and when you compare a lot of the moves with the chess engine, you'd realize that it's just slightly different. Now, of course, it is possible that you could have, I mean, uh, an operator, like, like some strong player running three or four engines, you know, and trying to figure out, you know, how to switch between his moves and, and the engine move. But can you really do that in a three-minute game? I mean, unless you're, you know, the Flash, who could slow down time as he moves, <laughs> you know, really, just, that's unrealistic and impossible. That's why people, many grandmasters choose three-minute games because the chance for a cheater is very small. Either he has to use a computer at 100%, which gets caught very easily, or he has to play himself. If he plays, you know, one move himself, one move in the computer, then it becomes a very uneven game, and what happens is, you know, you don't. he doesn't really know which move is good or not, so you could spoil, one move could spoil a perfectly great game that computer has made. So really, this was a human. But also... It shows a mystery because of the incredible playing style that I have not seen by many different chess players. So what we conclude is that there is a chance that this was Bobby Fischer. And there is a chance that we could see that greatness very in, in, in the very few games that he's played on ICC. He made it look beautiful and made me sad a little bit. Because I would have loved to see so many more games that he could have played from the 1970s to the early 2000s. 30 years of games with such power, passion, and strength. It doesn't matter if he would have won, if he would have become a war continued becoming a world champion, although I think that he would have been a world champion for many years. But the magic of these games, the value, the energy, and the, you know, a talent is something that happens once in a decade. And even though we never saw that, and the games of Fisher left behind are still some of the most incredible masterpieces that a chess player could study, the third coming, as I call it, is really something that um, many people would be quite excited about studying the, pa the the patterns and the different elements that the great player who I think was Fisher and Grandmaster Short also thought Fisher, it was Fisher back at the time could really have shown us what Fisher was really like and what we have missed with all these years when he wasn't playing and yet he decided to come back. Mm -hmm.